Plato has believed that the oneness of the world could be matched by the unity of knowledge. He believed that knowledge should be viewed as a whole and not as a collection of separate parts. I was born and raised in Israel, at the city of Jerusalem. It was an amazing experience growing up surrounded with so much history and such a great variety of cultures. I was raised in a religious family. And when I was 14 years old, I went to study in Yeshiva, a religious dormitory where a great emphasis is given to the study of the old Jewish scriptures. They used to quote the book of Joshua. Lo yamush sefer ha-Torah ze mipicha ve'agita bo yomam v'layla ki az tatsliach hedarkecha ve'az taskil. Loosely translated, it means that you should study the Torah all day and all night, and then you will be educated, and then you will be successful. It is a distinct view regarding knowledge and reality, that everything is located in one place, that everything is one. Well, I was there for two years, and then they kicked me out, and I had to find a new place which would agree to take me in. It took some time, but I found a place where I was able to open my eyes to the astonishing variety of sources for information. Later I learned that Aristotle was the first to introduce a division of knowledge. He divided it into theoretical inquiry and practical inquiry, balancing thinking as rhetoric, logic, mathematics, and ethics with the observation of nature as physics and astronomy. The unity of knowledge was lost. Well, I was fascinated by knowledge and I dedicated those years to the study of mathematics, robotics, and physics. It was then when I was recruited to an elite technological intelligence unit in the Israeli army. I went to engineering, in engineering school, studied electrical engineering, and I had the honor to serve with some of the smartest, most inspiring engineers I have ever met. But working with all those top-notch technology was not enough. Something was missing. I wanted to understand all that surrounds me. So I decided to learn biology. So I dedicated three years to the journey to a journey to the death of our understanding of life. But something was still missing. Science and technology didn't seem to encompass all that surrounds me, since we are also products of our history. So I decided to pursue yet another degree, only this time in philosophy and history. Three years later, I graduated, and after six years of service in the Israeli intelligence corps, I decided to leave and try to find out who I really am. I decided that I wanted to do research, so I joined the Center for Bioengineering in the Hebrew University. As soon as I heard the word bioengineering, I was curious. It was a true shock to what I had considered to be the structure of knowledge at that time. Later I learned that the structure of knowledge becomes more interesting when realizing that disciplines are interconnected, and indeed, disciplines are dynamic entities. Each discipline has three dimensions framework, concerns, and methodologies, and each discipline evolve along those three dimensions while creating bridges to other disciplines. When new bridges rise, new disciplines are formed, like bioengineering, astrobiology, and satellite archaeology. Today, the cross-connectivity of disciplines is breathtaking. It seems that the ever-growing body of disciplines becomes more and more interconnected. This is one reflection of the fact that the pursuit for innovation lies within the structure of knowledge. During my master's research at the Center for Bioengineering, I learned how true realization regarding science and medicine can emerge from the interconnectivity of allegedly discrete disciplines. So diabetes is a growing epidemic, affecting hundreds of millions of people all around the world. I overtook a project in which my main concern was diabetic retinopathy, which is the second most frequent cause for blindness in India and in the U.S. The disease is basically defined by microaneurysms, local expansions of capillaries in the retina that disturb the hemodynamic forces inside the capillaries, leading to cell dysfunction, leakage, and rapture. Leaked blood in the retina can cause black spots in the vision field, which can slowly progress into total blindness. So we developed a mathematical model that describes those microaneurysms, and we use this model in order to define a critical threshold for the treatment of microaneurysms using laser ablation. So what we have done is we used mathematical models to derive the dimensionless behavior of the problem 
We use numerical methods we derived from computer science to generalize it. We validated our model using a miniature model of the retina, which we fabricated using tools we utilized from the microelectronics industry. We used our findings to describe a classic phenomenon in fluid dynamics traditionally dealt with in applied physics. We then explored the implication of our results on living cells, and then we took our model to the clinics, experimenting with human retinas, which demonstrated the validity of our results. Thank you. Our insights emerge from connecting frameworks, methodologies, and concerns of different disciplines, and it can literally save patients' vision. Well, this project, it probably was a turning point in my life. It was the first time when I, where I experienced the power of large-scale integration of science. But connectivity can go beyond research and reach innovation and, ent and entrepreneurship. Last summer, I was invited to NASA Research Center in California to Singularity University, where I co-invented the glove tricoder. Modern medical interfaces neglect the, the, uh, the role of touch in the physician-patient's relationship. We decided to emphasize and enhance it. So we invented a new medical interface in the form of a glove that digitized touch and telecommunicated. Our technology can be embedded in recent medical revolutions as wearable diagnostic medical devices and telemedicine platforms. Our thinking revolved around utilizing capabilities from microelectronics, robotics, software engineering, and telecommunication. We also consider the implication of our results on society in terms of ethics and regulations. Another important aspect was the business model required to create an economically sustainable R&D. Again, it was more about connecting the dots than creating new ones. Connectivity can go beyond research and beyond innovation. It can even touch art. This is an image we took using high-resolution microscopy. This is the eye of a microstorm, only half the diameter of a strand of hair. This is a storm of nanoparticles which we introduced into a microfabricated device. So innovation can promote innovation and revolutionize education. It has changed the way I teach and interact with my students. Last year, I developed a, a course in which I took 20 students from 10 different disciplines, from computer science to neurobiology to atmospheric sciences and psychology. I taught them transdisciplinary methodologies in computer science, and I was amazed by the results. We were presented with projects that span from 3D visualization of clouds using direct link to NASA satellites, to data encryption and decryption using optical fibers. By making the architecture of knowledge, the syllabus of the course, we can give the education system the one thing it's missing the most, a meaning, a feeling that we are not educated to be a small screw in a great system, but rather we are taking a part in Plato's vision on the unity of knowledge and reality. So specialization is important but we cannot make it the only thing that matters. We can dissolve disciplinary boundaries by simplifying technicalities and reducing our challenges to modular design, as, and design is the one attribute in which human rise above all other known forms of life. Thank you.